Hi guys, Josh here with Northern Frogger and welcome to the Frog Room. Uh, so over the last week or so I've been answering quite a few uh, questions about the dart frogs. So I kind of thought today I would do a video uh, just kind of covering like the top five most frequently asked questions I get about dart frogs. Are they poisonous? Um, so this is by far uh, the most common question I get. Um, anybody that I tell that I keep these frogs or um, whenever I post an ad uh, for frogs for sale, I always get a ton of emails or questions um, just wanting to know uh, if they're poisonous or not because understandably with a name like poison dart frogs, um, people are a little surprised that you keep them as pets and kind of want to know how that works. Um, but the thing is, like, even though in the wild uh, some of these frogs are poisonous, um, and in fact the, uh, the Phyllobates terribilis, or the golden poison frog, uh, but even though that particular frog is considered one of the most toxic animals on earth, um, none of the frogs in my frog room are poisonous at all, and in fact no captive bred dart frogs are going to be poisonous. Um, unless in the rare instance someone is actually trying to make them poisonous. Um, the thing about dart frogs is that they actually get their poisons from their diet. Uh, in the wild they eat things like poisonous ants and beetles and stuff like that and they're actually able to uh, sequester those poisons um, from those insects and kind of isolate them and concentrate them and excrete them back out through their skin and that's what makes the dart frogs poisonous. Um, but in captivity the diets that we feed them don't have any of those toxins in them, so they just never develop those poisons. And in fact, even wild-caught dart frogs, uh, when kept in captivity and fed a captive diet, will lose their poisons uh, after a few months. And uh, there's one misconception I'd like to clear up, because I often see people hear that the golden poison frog, or Phyllobates terribilis, is uh, one of the most toxic animals on Earth. And then they want to kind of apply that to all dart frogs, which isn't really the case. Um, so I'll often see things on social media and stuff like that where somebody will have like posted a leucomalus or a tinctorius or one of the thumbnails or something like that and it's like, dude, you know that poison dart frogs are the most toxic animal on earth and it's like, that actually only applies to a few of the dart frogs. Um, and while a lot of them are poisonous in the wild, most of them are only kind of mildly poisonous and wouldn't really pose much of a risk to humans. Um, Unless you had um, like an open wound on your hands or something and you're handling them, uh, most of them aren't really toxic enough that you'd be able to absorb enough through your skin if you were to handle them briefly that it would actually harm you very much. Um, like, like I said, unless you had a cut or you were licking them or trying to eat them or something like that, then it could potentially harm you. But um, And some of them in the wild are not even poisonous at all. Like uh, The uh, Chizudas, the Ranidomea imitator, um, they call them imitator because they are colored like poison dart frogs, but they don't actually have any poison naturally. Um, so it is a misconception that all dart frogs are as poisonous as the, uh, the Phyllobates terribilis because those ones are really poisonous, but that definitely doesn't apply to all dart frogs. Uh, so on to question number two. Uh, so this question, um, it's kind of something that leads leads from the first question. Um, people want to know if they're poisonous when they find out they're not. Um, a lot of people want to know if they can handle them then. Um, and although the, the dart frogs aren't going to hurt you, um, we don't want to handle the dart frogs because um, we can actually hurt them. Um, the biggest risk is to their health. Um, there's like natural oils on your fingers or if you get, get any other contaminants on your fingers like soap or anything like that um, because uh, these dart frogs are amphibians in general but dart frogs kind of especially have uh, very permeable skin um, anything that's on your hands can be absorbed through their skin and can potentially harm them uh, so we generally don't want to handle them unless absolutely necessary um, and if you do have to handle them uh, you should wear like some kind of like latex gloves or usually what I do is just rinse my hands really well, no soap or anything, just rinse them really well under like fresh water. Um, but you do have to be careful because you're 
body's constantly producing oils and stuff like that too like you can't do it in the morning and handle frogs all day like because you will start to produce more oils and stuff like that so uh, it's a good idea if you're just going to handle a couple or maybe you need to move some from the tank to just rinse them and then move them right after uh, make sure you don't touch anything else in between um, but it is a pretty good idea probably best practice to wear some kind of gloves uh, while you're handling them and the only thing with that i think is to make sure uh, with latex gloves and stuff is that you get the non-powdered kind because uh, that getting that powder on their skin can kind of dry them out as well. Uh, so yeah, dart frogs should uh, really be treated as kind of a display animal only, kind of a look but don't touch kind of thing. Uh, similar to like an aquarium or something like that. Um, the other thing too is that they're really, they don't, don't really tolerate being handled very well. Um, it's not like you can just hold it in your hand and it's going to sit there and cooperate with you. They have a natural fear of anything bigger than them and uh, holding them they will kind of feel that as a as a threat and they will be trying to get away constantly um, and they are very quick and can jump surprisingly long distances so uh, it is pretty hard to handle them without just actually physically restraining them which uh, could potentially hurt them too so uh, definitely with dart frogs you just kind of want to leave them in their tanks because uh, it is a bit dangerous too if they do happen to get away from you um, because their skin is so permeable they're from some, and they're from such a humid environment. Uh, they don't have some of the ability, some of the other frogs, to retain moisture as well. So they will dry out extremely quickly um, outside of their high humidity enclosures. So uh, if one gets away from you and like gets into a crack between furniture or uh, down like a heat register or something like that, like it's pretty much game over for that frog. Um, if you don't find it within, <laughs> you know maximum an hour I'd say most of the time uh, they're just gonna be dried up and dead now uh, so that's a kind of another reason to just avoid handling them just to avoid the risk of losing them like that uh, so yeah just keep that in mind if you want to get dart frogs um, really not a pet that you should be handling just display animal only all right so on to question three um, usually about lighting and heat uh, you get a lot of uh, just general husbandry questions, but these are the two that kind of come up most often. And uh, I think it comes from a lot of people that have had uh, like some kind of reptile or something previously, or maybe have currently a reptile. Because um, a lot of them are kind of from tropical environments. Uh, a lot of them will need a an additional heat source, like a heat mat or heat bulb, something like that. And uh, a lot of reptiles too will need um, a UVB source, uh, so you need like a special UVB bulb to um, allow them to get the vitamin D3 uh, to metabolize calcium properly. But one of the great things about dart frogs, I think, um, is that they're pretty low maintenance in that respect. Um, even though they come from kind of tropical rainforest environments naturally, uh, they typically inhabit kind of the understory, um, either right on the forest floor or in the very kind of bottom of the trees. Um, so they would actually receive like very little to no direct sunlight uh, just because it's all shaded from the canopy above. Um, so it stays relatively cool down there and uh, and they've evolved to not really need um, to get their vitamin D from the sun. Uh, they typically get it from the food they would eat. And they're most comfortable kind of right around room temperature, around like low 70s Fahrenheit or uh, low 20s Celsius, uh, somewhere around there. So if your house is comfortable for you and it doesn't get too extreme, uh, extremely cold or extremely hot in the summer or winter, um, it's probably going to be just fine for dart frogs. Um, and then as long as you're supplementing your feeder insects properly, um, dusting them with supplement powders and vitamin powders. Um, there's no need for any kind of UV bulb either. So yeah, they don't really need uh, UVB bulbs, um, but they do, well, the frogs themselves don't need lights, um, but you will need some kind of light for your plants. Um, if you've got like a bioactive vivarium with living plants in it like this, um, you should have some kind of daylight spectrum bulb or LEDs uh, just to fuel that plant growth. And yeah, so daylight spectrum, you're probably going to want to find something within like the 5,000 to 7,000 Kelvin temperature range, somewhere in there. Um, I think natural sunlight is supposed to be around 6,500 and 
I think a lot of people kind of prefer or prefer that look anyway. Um, I think these ones are slightly higher. I think these are 7,000s. They've got a slightly more of a blue tinge to them. Um, but a lot of the compact fluorescents, and you can do it with either like the fluorescent tubes or the compact fluorescents, the spiral bulbs, um, or LEDs. Uh, so I think that's all I wanted to say about uh, heating and lighting for those guys. So on to the next question. Uh, so another very common question I get um, is about their diet. Uh, dart frogs have kind of a specialized diet. Um, and it's probably the most challenging thing, in my opinion, about keeping dart frogs. Um, they're generally pretty easy, but uh, just the fact that they'll only eat live foods um, is kind of the one thing that makes them a little bit more difficult, in my opinion. And it's actually true for the majority of frogs. There are very few frogs that uh, will accept um, dead prey items or, or like a prepared food, like pellets or something like that. For the most part, most frogs want to eat live foods and uh, dart frogs are no exception to that. And the other thing that makes dart frogs a little bit challenging is that they actually prefer very small foods. Um, whereas like most frogs, like these tree frogs, um, will pretty much eat anything that's moving that they can fit in their mouth. Um, dart frogs are kind of the opposite, is that they actually prefer to eat very small, kind of the smallest food possible. The food that they need you typically don't find in pet stores very often, at least around where I, where I am. Um, the, the most common live foods that pet stores have are things like uh, crickets. Crickets are kind of a staple uh, for a lot of frogs and lizards and stuff. Um, so a lot of pet stores will have crickets, but they usually don't have crickets small enough. Um, pretty much I know around here pretty much the youngest crickets you can reliably get are like one week old which are already pretty much too big for all these frogs. Maybe the Tinctorius could eat a one week old uh, cricket. Um, and a lot of the other things like all the worms like mealworms, superworms and uh, butterworms and stuff like that. Uh, those are all generally too big for these guys too. Alright so if they can't eat any of these common feeder insects, uh, what do you actually feed them? Um, so the main staple food uh, that pretty much all dart frog keepers and breeders are going to be feeding their frogs are flightless fruit flies. Um, and these are uh, strains of fruit flies that have been specifically uh, selectively bred to either have like reduced or malformed or just completely missing wings so they can't fly. Um, which is really handy because it makes it a lot easier to deal with them um, when you're feeding them, like dumping them from the containers or whatever, they're not just going to go flying out. And if any do escape, which is pretty much inevitable, if you're, if you're going to be keeping dart frogs, you're going to get the odd fruit fly escaping and crawling out, but uh, because they can't fly around, um, they're not very, not very mobile when they're walking around, so they typically don't survive very long. It's hard for them to find food and water and everything, so uh, it makes it a lot harder for them to kind of uh, breed inside your house and kind of colonize and become a pest. Um, and the other good thing about them not being able to fly is that it makes it a lot easier for the frogs to catch them. And they're going to behave a lot more like the ants and beetles and kind of terrestrial insects that they would normally eat in the wild. So sometimes you can actually find uh, fruit flies in pet stores. Um, it's uncommon, becoming slightly more common. Um, but for the most part, most people are going to be culturing their own. Uh, just because it's a lot cheaper that way and then you can kind of make sure you always have a continuous supply because even even the pet stores I know that do carry them it's not they don't always have them in stock so it's hard to rely on them and there's going to be two main kinds of fright, flightless fruit flies that you're going to encounter in the hobby and that's going to be uh, the Drosophila melanogaster which are the smaller version and the Drosophila hydei, uh, which is a larger fruit fly. Uh, but they're both still flightless. And there are a few other kinds you might come across from time to time. F fairly uncommon, especially in Canada, you might have uh, more luck finding other kinds down in the States. Um, but the staples are going to be the Melanogaster or the hydei. Um, and I do have a video about culturing fruit flies, um, so I'll put that link in the description down below so you can go check that out if you're curious about how that works. 
Um, and the other thing with the feeders is that uh, the fruit flies are not uh, really nutritionally complete, so uh, you do want to dust uh, the flies at every feeding with uh, some kind of vitamin and mineral supplement. Um, I think we'll talk more about supplements in a separate video. And in addition to the fruit flies, uh, there's going to be two other kind of main things that uh, your frogs are going to eat. Um, uh, but that's actually going to be the microfauna that you seed into your uh, bioactive barium. Um, so these are like springtails and isopods are the two main ones that people use. Um, but yeah, seeding uh, your vivariums with this microfauna, um, they're, they're going to help break down the waste, um, uh, like the frog poop and dead leaves and stuff like that. And they're just going to help keep that ecosystem in your uh, vivarium active and functioning properly. Um, and then it kind of provides a secondary food source for your frogs where a lot of times these things will live right in the soil but they will come up to the surface every once in a while and your frogs will pick them off when they see them. Um, which is can kind of serve as like a safety net um, if something comes up and you're away from your frogs for a few days and you can't feed them. Um, they're not going to starve, they are going to be able to graze a little bit on the, on the little microfauna that you have in your soil. Uh, so there's a couple good reasons to always uh, keep those and those are kind of things you can culture on your own too pretty easily. Um, so I might go over that. I don't have a video about those yet, um, but I will be doing one of those in the future. So uh, keep an eye out for that. Um, but yeah, I think that basically covers their feeding. Um, so on to the last question. I get this one quite a bit actually, but people want to know if they are loud. Um, which is kind of understandable, like if you're familiar with frogs at all, you probably know that most of them have some kind of mating call. Um, and if you've heard them out in the wild or anything, you probably know that they can be very loud. Um, right on cue, that's one of the Luke's calling. So not too loud, these are actually probably the loudest dart frogs in my uh, frog room are the leucomalus um, and they've kind of got that uh, a lot of people describe this kind of bird like more than frog like it's just kind of that trilling call um, and relatively soft it carries a little ways but I don't find it to be intrusive kind of um, so the general answer to that question I would say is no they're really not that loud and I will uh, at the end of this video I'm gonna throw a clip in I've got a clip of kind of all three of the, the males in that vivarium calling uh, so I'll throw that at the end so you can kind of get a better idea what they sound like um, I don't have much personal experience with uh, the Ufaga uh, genus but those ones can be a little bit louder I think um, but they've kind of got more of like a chirping call too um, not what you would typically think of like a frog call I think and I mean I find it pretty pleasant as well um, and the other thing to keep in mind with dart frogs is that they are uh, diurnal so they're going to be mostly calling during the day so um, even if you do get a louder one it's not like they're going to be keeping you up in the middle of the night like sometimes when the tree frogs get calling it can be pretty loud and they're <laughs> going to be only calling at night so but yeah the dart frogs will typically call during the day um, but if you are really worried about the noise, um, on the other end of the spectrum there are like the Tinctorius and the Erratus. Um, all of the frogs and those species are uh, extremely quiet, like you can hardly even hear them. Um, they just make a very soft uh, like buzzing noise kind of. You pretty much have to have like your ear to the vivarium to be able to hear it. Now uh, some of them are a little bit louder, like this uh, elk coat male, I can hear him from Usually if I'm within like probably eight feet of his vivarium, I can kind of hear him if it's quiet in the rest of the room. So yeah, if you're really worried about the noise and you want a quiet frog, I would recommend going with the any of the Erratus or the Tintorius because they are, their calls are almost inaudible unless you're standing like right there. I might see if I can throw in a clip of these guys too, but I've actually got video with a camera inside this vivarium. And you can see the male calling, but you can still just even barely pick it up. With
camera like eight inches away from them so that's how quiet those guys are uh but yeah that uh pretty much does it i think uh for the dart frog faq i uh, hope you guys enjoyed this video maybe learned a thing or two and if you did enjoy it uh, maybe do me a favor and hit that like button and if you want to see and learn more about dart frogs uh, please consider hitting that subscribe button as well i'm uh, coming out with new vi new videos every week and you can also follow me on Instagram at Northern Frogger. Um, pretty much posting daily, just kind of pictures, short video clips, um, and just kind of updates around the frog room. Um, so that's kind of the way to stay the most up to date on what's going on. And as always, questions, comments, suggestions are always welcomed and encouraged. Uh, so leave those down below there. Um, and enjoy the video of the frogs calling. And uh, until next time, happy frogging.